thank you everyone who joined us for our previous webinars today we have our third uh, webinar of the series uh, today uh, professor m balakrishnan from uh, iit delhi is joining us for webinar on assistec lab he has done his bs from bits filani in 1977 followed by his he has done his phd in electrical department from iit delhi in 1984 his research areas include assistive technologies embedded systems ED and system level designing FPGA architecture and tools he won uh, many awards but uh, uh, the some of them are national awards by DST in 2018 and 2016 for his work on refreshable braille display and on board he also won manathan award which is uh, given in the south asia for uh, best uh, use of ICT for the development and for his work on smart cane He also won national award by Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment in 2015 for his work on smart cane. He has more than 30 plus journals, 100 plus conference publications, two books and one chapter, uh, seven patents. Uh, he has 30 plus sponsored projects. Some of them are running right now. Uh, he has in the past he has our uh, 15 PhD students, five MSR, 120 MTech students. 80 plus BTEC student. So uh, these are some of the um, uh, brief overview of Professor M Balakrishnan. Now I would like to invite Professor M Balakrishnan to deliver a presentation on Assistec Lab, where he will talk about what is Assistec Lab, what we ha- uh, what uh, they have done in the Assistec, and what is the future plans. Uh, well, before before we get started, um, a small thing. So. Um, uh, Professor M. Balakrishnan will be using a presentation that uh, those of you who are sighted should be able to see it on the screen. For those who are blind, uh, can go to inclusivestem.org/webinar3.pptx and can follow along simultaneously. That's i n c l u s i v e s t e m dot o r g slash w e b i n a r three dot pptx. Over to you, sir. Yes. So. Um, First of all, thanks for inviting me to give this webinar. So I would, uh, in the next 40 minutes or so, I will try to present the work that we have been doing in the space of assistec. Of course, it's a joint activity uh, where there are a lot of students involved, there are a lot of research staff involved, and also my faculty colleagues and collaborators are involved. I will talk a little bit about that at the end of my talk. Broadly, we classify the Objective of Assistec to be finding technology solutions for the mobility and education of the visually impaired. Technology part becomes important because we are located in an industry of technology, and you know our objective is also to see whether the technology can impact people's lives, and in this case, the lives of visually impaired. Yeah. So the key challenge is that we look upon it, and of course, this for this community, I don't have to spend much time on motivation. Because you know you're all familiar with the needs of the visually impaired. So uh, in terms of the challenge, we have we look at two different challenges. One is on independent mobility and education. As uh, in assistec philosophy, these are the two very critical requirements for societal inclusion. Because independent mobility gives people a mobility. Not only for the purpose of you know social interaction, but for education, for vocation, and that becomes extremely important for a very large section of the society, which cannot have uh, assistance all the time. Uh, you know, assistance through a human being, so they need that mobility to be able to even survive. Education, of course, is extremely important in today's world, and almost any type of jobs are not possible without education. So these are the two clearly the needs. So around prior to 13 years back, when actually first I started working in this field, I was completely unaware of the requirements or what the tools and techniques, technology that people use in this this space. So it has all been a learning experience, and a lot of this learning has happened through our collaborators. Um, you know, especially I would I'm very grateful to Mr. Dipendra Manocha, who has played a very critical role in my awareness of what the challenges and what type of human solutions are likely to work so one of the things that we realized was what the role of a white cane um, in terms of the mobility and 
earlier of course we are seeing people with visual impairment blind people working with walking with white cane but what and all it can do wonderful things it can do if a person is well trained is something i became aware but the problem that got posed to us and this was clearly a these are we were very novices at the time in this particular field and you know everything all inputs came from users so the problem that was posed to us was detecting obstacles which do not have a direct footprint on the walking path but actually projects on to your upper body are becomes very dangerous so here we do have a picture of a, a tree which has fallen down but one of the branches is projecting and it could actually hit the person in the upper part because the cane the way that the cane is used it is only good to detect obstacles below the level of knee later on only we realized that why this particular problem remains unsolved at least not solved very uh, satisfactorily is primarily because these type of obstacles are very unlikely to occur in developed countries in you know high income countries where the footpaths and things are kept clear corridors are kept clear in a country where we typically let's say put an air conditioner or a room cooler and which room cooler or air conditioner jets out into the corridor it's a very acceptable practice in our country but most other countries will not especially the developed countries where the regulatory requirements are much stronger they will not allow such a obstruction to be on the obstacle to be on the walking path so what was projected to us was these obstacles are very dangerous and they Uh, can result in upper body injuries and people who go through have these injuries more than once they would actually lose their confidence to be able to even walk independently so that's an impact that it could have and it's very important that we can address this problem and that is the first problem that we took up for uh, addressing the solution i'm sure many of you would be familiar with this solution even though they may not be using it but just to maybe aware that we did create this uh, this is a very simple um, device which we call a smart cane which provides uh, primarily is an ultrasonic ranging device works for around 3 meters we do have a mechanism to reduce it to 1.8 meters when you are walking indoors so that if the range gets limited because 3 meters is too large a range for when you are walking in sun initial reaction for us initial let's say the design was that we can provide an audio output which can read out the distance but we were clearly told that the synthetic sound coming continuously is very irritating and can be very disturbing because the sound that comes from the surrounding when one is outside is extremely important for the safety of a blind person so then we adopted the uh, vibratory patterns as a method of conveying the obstacle presence of obstacle as well as the distance of the obstacle the way the device works is that uh, it vibrates the handle vibrates and the vibration patterns are become much more intense as you come closer to the obstacle it's meant to complement white cane functionality and typically in all of our experience what we have seen is users who have a reasonable ex- you know experience as well as uh, efficiency in using white cane are the ones who are able to best benefit from this to make it cost effective and also to work in indian circumstances so in this field now we have been there for some time so we understand lots of differences so the canes that are typically used in us and canada and japan these canes are much more hardy and they don't break easily but of course they also extremely expensive on the other hand the canes that are available in india are very inexpensive but they also break much more easily so it was important to protect the device so we adopted the strategy of putting this device on the top fold and it's also very easily detachable and the other thing is that we have to do a fair amount of work to make a grip which actually will be suitable for people who are already familiar with different grips people who are already using various grips we did not want them to have to switch their grips to be able to use the device of course on the electronics and software side we did do a lot of work on trying to make the device low power so today the device easily works for 14 to 15 hours after one charge typically we expect to see hours of usage per day when a person is walking and that uh, amounts to around maybe 5 to 6 days for charge the device the functionality was designed as a knee above obstacle detection but what we are seeing is there is also finding traction for the other use that it can have it is a non contact obstacle detection because even though certain obstacles which are below the level of knee let's say you know 
if a stone is there on the road which is actually can be detected by the cane that's fine but if let's say if a dog is sleeping on the road and if the user has to touch the dog to be able to find it could actually result in dangerous situations so the non contact detection and also in other circumstances when we are interacting or you know having a social gathering with human beings around so contact, making a contact all the time could also have an impact in terms of irritation or you know very not a very dignified contact so it also helps in doing a non contact detection of those surroundings so that's the device that we developed and uh, once it came to a stage of course it took a long time first of all the students were working on it they were obviously doing other things so it took some time for them to do the prototypes but once the prototypes are ready and we but get some amount of feedback from the users that yes the device has some potential uh, let us say use and potential acceptance then we started looking for funding for what's called translation research typically a device which gets generated in an academic institution requires a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot of changes to which, which is typically referred to as translation research which primarily involves how do we manufacture it how do we make sure that the device is certified there are lots of issues and optimizations that needs to be done from a user perspective from the point of your manufacturability from the cost perspective maintenance perspective so all these things become important and of course the support material that is required by the users designers using a device themselves is easy because they know ins and outs of the device they know both the strengths and weaknesses but then you need manuals you need training programs and so on and that took now and all these takes time as well as effort and also cost so we are very lucky in around 2011 we actually got uh, major funding from welcome trust which entered india at that time with a program called affordable health care in india and we were the first beneficiaries of that you know our proposal was the first proposal accepted and affordable health care in india which helped us to refine the product to a level that we could actually go to the users so this particular slide shows the device and its various you know packaging and all the other things by which it gets shipped just i have one slide which actually shows that you know the journey from 2005 to 2014 it's a nine year journey but i would effectively say it was a six year journey because three years were lost in just trying to find a funding the translation such funding to take the device out of the lab but those of you can see this slide you can see that from a completely rudimentary device very large bulky not usable to come to this sleek form by which the users are comfortable and various grips they can hold the device has been a fairly you know a lot of effort that went into it but uh, some of the important learnings that we have and when we started working on this it became very clear that the lab has to be very interdisciplinary in nature we were very lucky to Uh, get another collaborator in this process professor bb masudan rock is today co founder of the lab assistant lab and he provided all the support in terms of the mechanical design the grip design because those became much more challenging the electronics part of it the software part of it we could handle that's the strengths that we had in the computer science and engineering department where this work started and also our students had a lot of proficiency in this particular work but that was easy but you know uh, That, that became difficult. later once we released the uh, device in the market we now realized that there is a we are not alone in this field actually what had happened was there was a device that was actually available in uk before our project started the translation research funding came but at that point in time due to financial reasons or whatever the device was actually unavailable so they got some more funding and some maybe an investor came in and now so there is a device which is called ultra king except the fact that the way that the ultra king uh, was designed and the way that it sort of uh, it works so i think the users have a lot more you know the training that is required by the users because it's not a vibrating hand it's a vibrating pin power wise maybe it is more efficient but the fact that you have to now hold it in a particular grip and touch the pin is all our feedback that we have received is not very comfortable of course they have more than one uh, sensor and which also makes uh, it clear that you know so the training that would be required will be much longer but of course the most important part of the device which makes it very unattractive is its price at 680 pounds almost close to a thousand dollars 
the device was actually considered unaffordable even in developed high income countries for you know clearly there no penetration in countries like india so they had a very small market and they were when we launched the device we launched the device and today it's available at around 35 pounds equivalent of you know in india we are doing it at around 3500 rupees and that makes it extremely attractive and actually no competition exists in either in terms of volumes or in terms of usage but uh, as i go along and talk uh, talk about the other devices that we are working on clearly the issue that remains is we have to solve the local problem in this case the problem was of near by obstacle detection which is actually very important problem in for mobility of visually impaired in countries like india where the environments are much more unstructured and not that regulated and second more importantly we also make the devices or the solutions really affordable because at that price where the users can buy or even the schemes that the government has will support because at equivalent of 60 pounds even the adip scheme is never able to support even a few users whereas at the price that 3500 rupees that we are selling this device today adip scheme is supporting a large number of users to be able to have access to this device let me switch gears and talk about the other mobility device that we have been working on and in fact today there was a rajya sabha tv um, uh, story on this particular device it will get repeated tomorrow also and rajya sabha tv at 11 o'clock so those of you want to watch it can see this but uh, this is a device for uh, visually impaired to access public buses apart from walking the most other affordable transportation in urban centers is the public buses they are widespread and they are also essential for being able to go to work go to school in many environments uh, the buses are essential, very essential for commuting when it comes to access to public buses so it's a a uh, situation which is very weak in our country primarily there are two challenges one challenge is a global challenge which is the challenge of finding the route number if a person wants to have an independent mobility and he doesn't have, he or she doesn't have to rely on a co passenger waiting at the bus stop to find whether his or her bus has come then he has an independent mobility because there are a lot of challenges when you are actually asking uh, another person to help you to be able to board the bus first of all a person has to exist so you cannot be in a stop where there are no other people standing that you will not know but even we also have received uh, heard stories which have you know some people playing a prank has uh, informed of the wrong bus or even more interesting a story that came from one of the girls who were testing our device early on that the uh, person concerned is actually wants to cooperate but after some time you are not very clear that the person is still around or he has taken his own bus and left the bus stop because obviously if his own bus comes he is not going to be waiting there to be able to support you when or to inform you when your bus comes so this was another problem that uh, uh, visually impaired persons are uh, faced when they are asking in a bus stop to continuously check whether the person who actually offered to help is still around all this means that an independent mobility is uh, important but the second part which is even more complicated and which actually is also a reason such a solution has not emerged from outside is the fact that the buses do not stop in a bay when it comes to indian cities and uh, this is clearly not only true of indian cities but also true of many countries like in southeast asia in uh, you know in south countries and many other low income countries where there is a lot of slow moving traffic which actually is on the bus stop crowds are there as well as slow moving traffic also vendors are there which makes that the buses actually stop not next to the bay but sometimes uh, quite far from our own estimate show that 20 to 25 meters is the uh, distance that the user may have to travel to be able to actually go and locate the entry door of the bus and and this part of locating the entry door is a big challenge and again a challenge which is very peculiar to ours and we needed a solution and of course again this problem was posed to us not by us but by eventually by users that we find the technology solutions so i have another slide which shows a bus cleanly stopping in a bay in, you know it's in singapore so you know which is uh, clearly not the way that the system works yeah. 
Okay. So we developed a solution, and this solution was also developed for a long time, but it did not go out, and we did not refine it because we focused on getting first our first device smart cane out, and only then we started working on this device to be. Uh, because the, there was a bandwidth issue, there are funding issues, and but basically it works on a principle that we have a RF transponder system. So the user carries a small RF device. On the bus there is another RF device. User can query. The user hears uh, the bus coming, approaching. More than one bus could be approaching, and the device user device has just very two simple buttons: one for query, another for select. presses the query button all the buses in the vicinity respond with their route numbers on in rf this device can collect all the responses and read out one by one locally on the device we solve a small so we implement a small slotted network protocol because the buses could be responding and there could be collision there could be number of buses and so if there, there's a collision so it works on gets an acknowledgement that the user's device has heard otherwise it again sends the query back again uh, the uh, it sends the uh, not query so it sends the root number again to the uh, transmits on the rs so it's a simple slotted network protocol that's implemented and our uh, calculation show that we can one will be able to handle around eight buses seven to eight buses we simultaneously approach the bus stop and that's a fairly large and once if the user finds that one of the routes is of interest to the uh, user then he can press the select button and once the select button is pressed then the bus which has been selected responds giving an audio cue the speaker is fitted next to the entry door of the bus so on that when it responds it speaks out let's say in this particular slide speaks out the number 501 and that particular number gives the idea that gives an audio cue for the user to move towards the bus please remember this audio cue is helpful in multiple ways not only that the user actually comes to know what's the route number of the uh, where the entry door of the bus is so the audio cue can helps the user to navigate uh, himself or herself towards the entry door but it he also comes to know whether the bus is still moving because if the audio cue is moving that means the bus has not come to a stop because our transaction starts before the bus actually arrives at the bus stop and so then it also is helpful for the user to know whether the bus has come to a stop after we conducted the trials we realized that there is another thing that this does which is very interesting which we did not see from the user perspective but which is from the very important from the other stakeholder which is the bus operator bus so when we had conducted a large scale trials of this device in mumbai and then finally went so it these were installed on 25 best buses and when we went and met the general manager he informed us that this device is very useful not only from the point of the user but also from the point of the company because we are publicly announcing in some way that the person with special needs is wanting to board the bus it increases sensitivity it also puts some public pressure on them for them to wait for this particular user or even help him or her board the bus and this is something which makes this device extremely interesting because how do we build such a compassion or such empathy in the drivers and conductors to be able to support them and in this case it actually happens naturally because the device the bus is actually speaking out allowed the route number which actually is an indication that somebody with special interest is planning to do so this is uh, what i am showing you is an installation that we carried out on the mumbai buses So at that point in time, our installation actually had a separate battery because we are the things were under trial and we didn't were not we are not using the bus battery. We were having a separate battery, but we also fitted it on the window next to the seat, which is actually for the reserved for the people with special needs in the front of the bus. And they are also allowed to board the front from the front in Mumbai. So actually, this particular entry door, which is next to it, was helpful for the. users to board and directly take the seat from the mumbai trials which actually almost happened more than a, a year and a half back so we have been able to do a lot of work again through another funding from bst where we have been now able to miniaturize the user unit considerably we have been able to miniaturize the bus unit considerably and also to make it compatible to work with the bus batteries so we now have a solution which actually 
is uh, fully ready for large scale deployment. In fact, uh, the solution that I am now showing you on the slide, this slide number 15, it actually has been installed on nine uh, DMTS buses and other three more buses belonging to the blind organizations. And they have been extensively tested both for ruggedness as well as in terms of their uh, effectiveness. Yeah. Though what we are finding is in daily the number of users who actually use the bus are far fewer and they are also uh, comfort level with using the bus is uh, also smaller because the buses are much more you know in terms of where they stop and in terms of what the general uh, let us say uh, uh, situation that exists in the bus stop is not, not all that conducive for even for people who are, you know, may not be visually impaired, but who may be older and so on. There is in Mumbai, we saw a lot more users who are actually bus users because these trials we are essentially conducting with bus users just to be, not to have any safety risk because of the device. And so we find that uh, though the device is getting ready, but the, in terms of, uh, for actually for in places like Delhi or places where these uh, buses are, you know, let's say the discipline levels, even all of, among the crowd as well as the bus operators is lower, it will going to be a bigger challenge in operation. Let me again switch gears and now talk a little bit about the work that we have been doing in the space of education. So uh, many of the uh, this webinar listeners would already be familiar with Braille. So you know there is not something that I need to talk about, but. Uh, uh, the issue is uh, Braille is of course quite widely popular among the blind. Also there are a lot of blind schools. Of course with uh, more schools becoming inclusive that's going to be a challenge because they, the teachers also don't know Braille and they may not have any training in Braille. But the challenge is in terms of tactile diagrams. How do they access visually impaired access pictures? And this particular problem we faced because we were trying to make a self-learning manual for our smart game. And we wanted to explain the principle of ultrasonic ranging and uh, the team that was working on it had a big struggle because when they went to number of blind schools which are actually con considered to be well equipped so they also did not have any mechanism to make this tactile diagrams or the mechanism that were there were rather primitive and then this idea came that why don't we look at the you know production of tactile diagrams itself because we realized that the books that were being given in India to the blind students were actually only containing Braille, only the text because of the large number of Braille presses government had established which are producing Braille pages at a reasonable cost. The Braille text was available, but no diagrams were available. This was in sharp contrast to the type of material that we saw in UK and US where there are a lot of tactile diagrams, textbooks and everything was available. Almost anything that a sighted child could read in terms of textbooks, a similar textbook was available for a visually impaired with all the tactile languages. So this gap was very large and then we also realized that the technology that they used for production of these tactile diagrams was so expensive because a lot of material is produced in swell paper which actually costs almost two dollars per page that this cost was one of the reasons that uh, tactile diagrams did not enter the Indian market. Of course uh, this is a series on STEM, so you all understand the need for diagrams, maps, bar graphs, science diagrams and so on and so forth. All of them are extremely essential if one has to actually pursue science education. The diagrams play a very critical role. Economics, science, mathematics, geometry for example. In all of this, if the uh, uh, visually impaired have to have access to this, they need tactile diagrams. So we started working on the production of the tactile diagrams, we looked at the technology end to end. By this time our team had become very interdisciplinary. We were no longer a uh, uh, no, group of people who were only looking at electronics and software, but we were also looking at mechanical engineering, we were also looking at design. So it, then it was easy for us to put in a team which was a very interdisciplinary team and we are fortunate that we got the funding for Center of Excellence in Tactile Graphics from METI which is the Ministry of Information Technology. We sent a proposal to them and we are pretty quickly we got funding for it and the whole idea was that we will do everything from software to designers to the process of production of tactile diagrams. We look at it uh, and try to solve the problem end to end for affordable tactile diagrams. 
So today, uh, so now I'm very happy to share with you that we have been successful in doing that. We have produced a large number of tactile books, working very closely with NCRT. And also we have produced books for other users and we have also mastered the whole technology. So it's not rocket science, it's fairly straightforward. So the software part of it is still, uh, we have a first version of a software which is able to follow guidelines. So there are these guidelines like BANA and so on. These guidelines define how the diagram has to get simplified or how the diagram, how the labeling has to be done. So many things it talks about so that one can take a diagram which is made made for the site net and make it useful for the visually impaired. So we are now a set of designers who understand these guidelines and can use tools like Corel Draw or uh, Adobe Illustrator to simplify a diagram made for the site net and create a diagram for them. And then 3D printing has become very widespread. So we are using 3D printing to make the molds and then using the thermoforming technique. In this process, we also developed a high-speed thermoforming machine because presently all the thermoforming that was happening was manual, which is not good when you want to produce a large number of uh, copies and with some repeatable in terms of quality. The software part also now very simple diagrams. Today we have a software which can actually do the simplification on the fly. It can take a diagram. Of course, it still requires a lot of improvements for handling complex diagrams for very simple diagrams. It's able to. Uh, and we have been doing this work now in the lab and we have produced a large number of books, but clearly uh, IIT cannot uh, start production of these books. So what we have essentially now done is we have been able to uh, incubate a company called Race Lines Foundation, which is a non-profit Section 8 company and is now accepted under the TBIU program of IT Delhi, the Technology Business Incubation Unit program. And it will start soon operating, maybe starting early next month, it will soon operating from Sonipat Complex. And it will be uh, in the process of clearly scaling up and production of the books. Again, to show you the cost differential, so, uh, with American Printing House, <coughs> with which we have been talking for other things and I've been visiting them regularly. So we found out that their price for a pay production of a page works out to be almost $2. Whereas what we are today doing it is around 25 cents, but we are very hopeful that in a, within a year's time or year and a half time, we'll be able to reduce it to 15 cents or so. One of the challenges is that still we are importing the sheets, the thermoforming sheets. Though they are not too expensive, but still they are expensive and uh, being just plastic sheets, so it should be possible if you can actually locally source them. We are looking at uh, all possible options of sourcing this within India and then we may be able to do a substantial reduction of uh, cost of these diagrams. Let me come to the last topic that I want to talk about in terms of access to digital text. Of course, access to digital text for the visually impaired is not very difficult because people can use screen readers and I'm sure all of you are familiar with screen readers and are using them in your day-to-day -day, both work as well as education. But Braille has its own role so it is very clear that a lot of uh, studies have shown that it is important that uh, uh, especially when the uh, person starts reading and writing he has to get familiar with Braille and he has to uh, because the writing part of it becomes difficult unless somebody has a good familiarity with Braille. The reading and writing are complementary skills. So refreshable Braille displays are devices which actually have the pins which pop up and down and create Braille characters. And uh, it's like a line display and uh, a person can touch it and read line by line. These again devices have been around for a very long time. It's almost three decades that these uh, electronic refresh to Braille displays have been around. Except that their cost has been prohibitive and there are hardly any penetration in countries like India. So we took up the challenge almost five years back, uh, five maybe more than five, almost six years back, of trying to create a um, Braille display which is inexpensive. So we realized that one of the key things is the key technology of Braille cells because the Braille cells which are piezoelectric actuator based cells which everybody was using was highly proprietary item. There are very few manufacturers, two manufacturers, one in Japan, one in Germany make the cells and people buy these cells and make devices. So many companies that actually make devices buying these cells. This being a completely uh, proprietary and patented technology was extremely expensive. The cost of each cell 
was working out to be 25 to 40 dollars per cell and that makes that a device which is actually made out of it is going to be very expensive so we started working on the core technology so rather than using piezoelectric actuators we started uh, designing these cells using what's called shape memory alloys uh, and these alloys uh, have a property by which you can make an actuator you pass a current it heats up and then it shrinks by the temperature rise so it operates within a certain temperature range and in that heating and cooling you can actually make an actuator and it has these actuators have been used for many other applications but now we use them for making the refreshable braille cells and what you are seeing now on the slide 21 is a uh, prototypes of a 20 cell device and a 40 cell device that we have developed. So we have been able to do both. We have been able to cut down the cost of these devices extremely, you know, at least uh, by six times from the what the devices that are available in the market. But we also have making dev these devices to be very high features. So they actually compete with devices that are very expensive today, primarily because we have all the software and these devices can be used not only for reading braille, but they can also be used for surfing the web, emailing, document preparation. So uh, I would say uh, uh, like a laptop, not a high-end laptop, but let's say whatever is the early laptop that could be, one could do, they could, could do almost everything using these devices. So they are standalone and they can, of course, they connect with uh, Wi-Fi as well as with Bluetooth with other devices that uh, one may have, one can connect to a desktop or a laptop and you can transfer files. And so, on. so these two prototypes, what you are seeing are now ready and uh, the present stage is that uh, these are uh, focus group trials have happened and now they are being produced in some volume so that we can go and do large scale trials. So that is the status that we have. Okay. And again, this particular slide shows that something which cost $2,500, we want to bring it down to $600, equivalent of $600 and to reduce the price that is 4x. In case of the higher end device, we are looking at something like 6x reduction in prices, which we think will be instrumental in taking it to a much larger number of users within countries like India and other low income countries. So this is what I wanted to talk about the device, but I will also like to share with you that the challenges that uh, we faced in reaching where we are. When we actually first launched the smart cane on 31st March 2014, that was the time when the Disability Commissioner of India we invited him in a function in the seminar hall at IT Delhi and he launched the smart cane for public. And another by October, November, we were into volume production. So the, our technology partner, our production partner, uh, Phoenix Medical Systems, was capable of then producing large number of them by the month of October. And then you know, next year we got registered in, enlisted in ADIP, and ADIP started giving large volume uh, demand. And then of course other users also picked up. Uh, other organizations also started. Uh, ordering devices from us. But one of the challenges we found, and this is a situation which is very different in countries like India, at least in India and countries in outside, let's say UK or US. So if you go to American Printing House, they actually have an address of every blind student in US who is actually attending uh, school and for which they have to supply support in terms of material. So that's the level of uh, organization and documentation that exists to be able to reach out. Similar thing that uh, we found in RNIB, they have access to information for almost every visually impaired uh, person within UK. So they are able to reach them, they are able to send them newsletters, they are able to give them updates on what they are doing and whether the solutions. Most of the challenges, though we have this large number, 5 million uh, uh, people who are, you know, visually impaired and spread of course all over our continent like size country but the challenge is they are all attached to if they have any first of all a large number who are perhaps in small towns and villages they don't even in touch with any organization even if they are touch with organization in cities as well as in other towns where there may be organizations which work in this space each of these organizations are very small and they serve the needs of very small number of visually impaired who live in that location 
there are thousands of such organizations which exist in this country so it was very hard to if you have a technology if you have a solution which can actually help a person how do you reach them itself is a big challenge in our case we did this very seriously we actually tried to create channel partners today we are almost 40 plus channel partners across india we don't have any northeast but uh, outside of that we have and most of the states in india covered with one or more than one channel partner who actually is aware of our device they have people who are trained to be able to uh, you know uh, trainers who are trained and special educators are trained and who can actually train the users on the use of this device so that is uh, uh, that's the effort that uh, put in and of course this particular uh, creation of these channel partners across the country has helped helping us also in dissemination of other products but i think we still have to go a long way of creating an ecosystem by which people can be reached and that's going to be a big challenge as we go and make us to technology more and more as to technology available to the people i will now try to summarize the work that we have done so i talked about smart cane and i want to give you a status of where we are so we are on 50000 devices that have been sold in india and 700 devices have gone out to the country to 12 different countries so this year we are also hoping to do a launch in us uh, and we are working with trying to identify partners or organizations which will be able to do that in case of onboard we are done pilot testing on 25 best buses and we are doing this testing on 15 dmts buses here we are really struggling to get a donor who would actually do a city wide installation the challenge is till now is though we have very good results in bombay for example mumbai for example 94% of the time we did more than 350 unsupervised boardings and they were able to board the first bus on the route and this we found by asking them to note down what time they reached the bus stop and what time they caught the bus and if it was less than the frequency of the bus then we uh, assumed that they got the first bus on the route but the challenge is that this is all synthetic in the sense that all these users who are doing this as trials how effective it is when they people are going to work people are going for their schools or they use it in a normal day to day setting their use setting and this requires that we need installation on large number of buses because on one route or one uh, no one timing it's not possible that large number of users we can find so and of course the finally we want to go towards regulation making it a regulatory requirement for all buses to have such device so that they are become accessible just like for accessibility they talk about low floor buses for uh, accessible for wheelchairs as well as for older people similarly like ramps for buildings similarly we are very clear that finally it will happen through regulatory requirement but to be able to reach that regulatory or make a proposal to the regulators we want to be clear in terms of its effectiveness by actually installing it at one city wide station so today we are looking at 1000 buses and 1000 users to be given this device over a period of 6 to 9 months to be able to get enough evidence to then go for the village in case of tactile diagrams so we as we said we have produced many ncert books and now we have incubated this race lines foundation in case our refreshable braille displays focus group trials are now almost complete and now we are going in for large scale uh, some volume production i won't say large scale 20 to 30 pieces and then go for pilot testing among a large number of users we are hopeful by end of this year we'll be able to launch this as a product in the market in my talk i already mentioned mr deependra manocha so i'm mentioning the key collaborators and uh, i'm very grateful to all of these people who have done wonderful you know we've been able to collaborate extremely well to be able to do what we have been able to do mano dipen mano cha has always been you know uh, uh, sort of working with us projecting the requirements and also helping us to network with the rele relevant people who are in the field giving us solutions giving us partnerships and helping us in multiple ways so samasudan rao who is a designer innovate and you know, also leads the innovation activity has always been with us in terms of both mechanical design and all those inputs that are required for making any of these products successful rohan has one early student and who was extremely dedicated to this particular committed to the work so he was involved in the smart cane project but it was not uh, just the involvement in terms of a student but he went much much beyond that he was always available to us even after he graduated he was in working on the project then he came 
and spent a uh, year with us as a postdoc to make sure that the product features exist. Piyush is somebody who is the lab manager right now and extremely committed and is very clear that uh, his life is going to be working in this space. So which is very rare for people at that age to think that yes, they could actually would like to make a difference by making a career of both uh, finding solutions, doing dissemination, doing whatever it takes to be able to go to the users. This is a picture of uh, taken some time back. It's not a very new picture. So of course, the group, a lot of group members have changed, but they also saw a lot of group members have continued with us. And these are, we have a group, at any point in time, we have 20 plus research staff who are working on various projects. And we have a, maybe 25 to 30 students who are involved with us in various ways throughout the year. I would now like to uh, at least stop and then maybe have some discussions. So uh, we call our lab a sister and we live with a dream and the dream is to be able to touch a million lives by being That is the way that we look at the system. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bala, for uh, introducing us with the Assistive Lab and uh, with the efforts which we are taking at the Assistive Lab for making the mobility and education accessible. Now we are open for the Koyanye. Uh, everyone can use the chat box for the, uh, asking the questions. Hi, sir. Uh, thank you for me. Yes. Okay, so our uh, special to Professor Bala, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. I think it was very uh, insightful. Uh, I did visit Assistec Lab a few months back and uh, I have seen all these devices and uh, mighty impressed with the team as well. I had a few questions. Um, uh, the first question was regarding the public bus uh, access system. Uh, after I uh, and also connected with the uh, BMTC organization, with, uh, the you know, Professor Raj Gopal, who, who basically has uh, the, uh, the technology arm of that uh, organization. So I wanted to know if we could do a trial run here in Bangalore. Yeah, it is possible. Yes, we can do a trial run. So, you know, uh, so the issue is that uh, uh, just uh, one thing is a small scale trial. I'm not sure how much more data we can get because we can share the small scale trials that we have done with 15, 20 buses, uh, 25 buses in Mumbai, 10 buses earlier in Delhi and now with 15 buses which may go up to 20 if they permit us to open more buses. But uh, now presently what we are really looking at is the large scale trials, you know, so something where people we are not bringing people for trials, but they actually take it for the regular use. And this will happen only if they are it is installed on a large number of buses uh, to get enough evidence. So the issue is that uh, bus companies typically are loss making companies and they tell us that they will not be able to fund us, but uh, they are ready to install it and make it available to the users. That way they are ready to collaborate. But uh, we still need to get funding source to be able to manufacture enough of these devices and install them and run their plans. So we have a proposal I can share with you. Uh, and you know, if we can get a uh, good funding, you know, either through CSR or through any other means, if we can get, uh, I'm not sure whether the bus company themselves will be ready to fund. We are ready to do it in any city as long as uh, we can get this funding to be able to do a large scale. A small scale trials. So what I might know. be the cost of this device? Uh, uh, what might be the cost of this device? See, the cost or of the device in mass production, we expect that the user device will be less than 500 rupees and the bus device will be less than 5000 rupees okay. in mass production. Okay, so, uh, and of course, running the trials and so on. So, we have a projected cost of 1000 users, 1000 buses. Of course, we can scale it down if that number is uh, uh, not possible. Nine months, three months for production and installation and six months of trial. So the total cost works out to be around 2.2 crores. This is to install it for 1000 buses, 1000 users and over trials over nine months. 
we have an industry partner and if any of these costs can be borne by a local agency then this cost can come down you know because like bombay for example xrcbc has said that they can recruit the volunteers so we don't so you know so some cost comes down because of that or if somebody wants to if our manufacturing partner is only to supply the devices and somebody else is to conduct the trials then the cost can definitely come down because then they don't have to employ their people but this is the overall cost assuming that the trials have to be conducted by uh, in this okay thank you so i can actually probably uh, so professor rajgopalan was asking uh, initially when i had introduced this uh, idea and so maybe i'll discuss with him and we can write to you jointly uh, you can write yeah, yeah. i can share the proposals are ready they are also now sending it to many csr uh, you know people who may be interested in doing this as csr okay okay now once this trials are over we plan to go for regulation you know we have to say that you know yes Okay, thank you, sir. So, uh, so I had another question. Can I go ahead, uh, Karthik? Is yeah, that okay? Yeah, please. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. So the other question that I had was uh, regarding a digital text. Um, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, I am here. Uh, yeah. Okay, sir. So uh, I just want to know regarding so the uh, for the ref refreshable braille display that uh, you're working on. So right now, um, you know, from what it seems to us uh, is that the cost would be somewhere around fifty thousand uh, rupees um, for the um, uh, forty cell uh, display, right? Forty cell with forty board will be between fifty and sixty thousand. Uh, and uh, for the 20 yeah. service between 30 and 35 yeah so uh, so so our experience in the field uh, so we have been in uh, in this uh, so i represent vision empire i don't know if you know about us we are incubated at triple it bangalore so we are uh, also trying to help in the ecosystem in our own small way so wherever we find technologies which might be of use to the students we basically working on stem education so we would like to take these to the schools so i i did speak to piyush regarding this uh, device the thing is that um, affording uh, at this cost even at 30 to 35000 per child uh, is kind of out of reach for uh, 70% of the students in the schools that we are addressing so i wanted to know if uh, if there is any uh, plan of uh, any further technologies to make it more affordable no we are working on it i think you know uh, it will take time you know but uh, there has been a lot of challenges technical challenges especially you know i mean so i have a feeling that we may be able to do another reduction but that may happen only after a year and a half see the uh, at the time when we started there were no low cost affordable bread place today they are actually if you look into it we have competitors in the market which have also made bread displays that are uh, affordable when there is a company that has come from it bombay called prelmi they also have uh, displays that have come orbit is another company which has also started making uh, of course of course their features are less they don't have so much of software and they are not stand alone devices that way our device is much better but in terms of as a braille display i think we also are giving very affordable displays this did not exist when we started so at that time we were you know uh, and but at the same time when we started i think many others also started because it came from this initiative from the global world blind unions on called transforming braille they they realized that if people do not read braille then they will have problems in terms of vocation jobs retaining so there is a fair amount of competition also in this field which is good because which will also bring the best in terms of what the prices but at this point we are not in a position to say but if volumes increase and we are able to do more optimization we should be able to but i think it's and how to do it and to get up to the lowest price
Okay, so in this one, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, from what I know of uh, the technology that's being used from the software side, uh, the Libluid driver, which is used for uh, working on apps and other uh, applications on the uh, uh, device, uh, does, I mean, is there already support for local languages? The other device will be released with support for English and Hindi. Uh, but uh, it should be uh, not too difficult to create support for. We are building a lot of it on open source, so we are uh, hoping that uh, uh, other our partners will be able to create local languages. That's the strategy we took in case of Smartkin also. Many of our translations have been done by other organizations because in terms yes. of the manuals and things like the language manual. Because for us to do other languages is hard because unless your team has good people who are experienced, we can't do the best thing. But uh, our strategy will be that it should actually be uh, able to work in other languages. That's how we will. Be. Okay. So, as Vision Empire, I'd like to uh, reach out to you uh, because we want to have a team which would then work on. Uh, uh, the local languages, the uh, uh, South Indian local languages. So, if Absolutely. we can uh, uh, reach out to you and uh, then we can continue this discussion offline. Well. Absolutely. You can do that. And you should Thank also you. consider, like if you are talking about STEM education, you should also consider the tactile diagrams because yes. that yes. will now be able to supply very quickly. Yes, sir. So, we are already in discussion with Piyush and we have already procured some and we will procure more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, anyone else? Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other queries? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is uh, Sonal from. I'm calling from USA, and uh, I really love the idea of this tactile diagram because, uh, and I have question for Professor Bala. Uh, is uh, have you considered using this laser engraving? Now in USA that has become, after the 3D printing, that has become pretty uh, popular and the printers are also not that expensive and it can engrave on wooden blocks and uh, I just uh, wanted to ask because I recently saw it working and I first thing I thought about was is this can this be useful for people who cannot see you know, uh, this kind of diagram uh, production okay so we are using 3d printing only to make the mold yes we can also make the mold using laser and printing it is possible okay. we are trying to uh, you know but uh, presently the cost of the you know these molds also uh, cost of the mold is also important uh, unless you do a very large number of copies the mold cost is to be distributed onto the actual uh, diagram box so here what we do is we take a very simple sheet of paper we use very little of even the mold material because we, uh, we only do the diagram in terms of what the outline of the diagram is on the 3D printing and paste it on the paper, which becomes the mold. Okay, so it's a very low cost thing. So laser engraving, of course, is very good, very accurate also, and it can be definitely be used. And uh, uh, we have done some samples with it, but uh, we still don't know how to make it cost effective because the base material becomes more. Okay, thank you. Because the base material that I saw was the thin pieces of just plain wood, just like plywood or something. No, no, but you know, but please, what uh, you to understand what our process is. Once we make the mold, we are using the thermoforming. Okay. So this paper and the, the, the you know the uh, plastic sheet is the brelon sheet, and the mold is goes into the thermoforming machine and it. Uh, that's all. Mm -hmm. That's all. The copies do not have any 3D printing. Only the mold has 3D printing. That's how it works. So the wooden block cannot be so thin that it can actually go into the. Mm -hmm. Of course, it has uses. We can know. We are looking at some use for it, but it is not directly for the that. Okay. Thank you. Any 
any other uh i have a question uh, this is venkatesh am i audible yeah. yes very good uh yes um, so pradeep bala this is regarding the onboard bus system that you uh, talked about right um so my question was uh, the choice i mean is there any specific reason why uh, rf was used as opposed to you know a smartphone based thing or a mobile based solution we have a solution I, mobile based solution today so okay. we put a bluetooth and we do have a solution so we can also do but we are getting very low range there okay the standard mobile uh, solution uh, is not giving adequate range there is not enough time for a person to location okay i mean uh, my yeah yeah please go ahead sorry in a friendly environment it will work in the sense if the bus is going to come and stop at the bay that is clear yeah. then you don't need this device mobile will work but if right. you have to sort of find the uh, no in fact start engaging with the bus even before it reaches the stop at 50 right. or so then the mobile will right uh, right okay so features it's able to yeah so even gps was not really helpful i suppose then because this idea of the speaker was i really like the idea that you know the bus yeah, itself will start alerting so that is enough now the right. bus uh, has started having speed, uh, gps so right. we can uh, no integrate them they still are not using open systems so the closed systems that we are not using but i okay. think early days for gps and all the systems is started but right right, right. so i had one more question uh, regarding the same uh, with respect to user trials that you perform so uh, how how do you generally gather data when you are doing a trial in in an open environment right i mean my understanding is you can correct me is that you done trials with people who are used buses on their regular routine and handing them these devices so Well, how would you? I mean, what are the challenges that would be in doing a, a trial in an open air? Other things are fine. You know, you have to do the train, the train, the train. These are much and even smart game because the walking thing. The bus okay. is a challenge, especially you know uh, when you so. So we do three uh, three things. We do what's called. Uh, supervised semi supervised and unsupervised we go through three stages right. uh, supervised is somebody accompanies the person and actually virtually like you know uh, holds him and is holding yes. the bus yes. only thing is he is using the device the usually paid person is using the device but there is a person next to him all the time right right semi supervised what we do is the per- other person is present and it means only if he feels that the situation requires intervention yeah it that is a semi supervised unsupervised is when the person has actually has to do it by himself for the unsupervised part we only use the existing bus user yeah okay we do not use the uh, people who are not confident of themselves using the bus because right. of the fact that you know if there is an accident so yeah yeah, yeah. people will think that it's because of the device yes yeah and how was the data collection process like did you guys have some telemetry in the system or was it you based on the time a lot of video recording when they supervised or you know when we supervised mm-hmm. uh, a lot of video recording happening and also in the unsupervised and that was the best uh, let us say uh, uh, most effective part of it was in mumbai we did 350 unsupervised boardings okay. and in the unsupervised boardings the user was expected to record two things the time He or she reached the stop in the time he boarded the bus. Okay. He had to only report these two things, and he was asked that you go to this particular bus stop, board a bus, and get down at this, and then you can go home or wherever. Yes, got it. Got it. And, uh, and uh, two times, and in the evening, somebody would call him up and get both the times that he has recorded. And okay. Right. This was right. the process followed in. Yes. And then looking at the frequency of the bus, we decided whether he was able to board the first bus or not able. To. Yes, yes. got it. Thank you so much. Maybe we can have one or uh, two more questions. If if someone has it. If uh, no one, yes, I have. Then I have a comment. 
uh, I really like the, all your slides but I have one curious question especially you showed all the slides about uh, people using this device in India and uh, it was striking to me that uh, all the slides had male members so do you think not many female will really be willing to use these devices in India especially in Mumbai and Bangalore and and have you thought about this you know how will you encourage the you know, smart phone has a lot of uh, uh, women users we also have videos on the uh, I can smart kit bus ID was a challenge on board actually on board even among the uh, for the men or anything there was a challenge to get enough people to the bus mm -hmm. supervised boardings uh, we did use women uh, uh, volunteers in uh, Mumbai as well as in Delhi Mumbai more than Delhi uh, because they all came through certain organizations and if we left it to the recruitment of the volunteers was left to the our partner like XRCBC Mumbai as well as we gave the broad uh, uh, thing. But uh, for example, now our trials that are happening on refreshable brain display, there are a lot of it. Okay, so when we are going to a blind school, uh, and we also have access to a women's, a blind women's hostel close to IT, we they also sometimes come over and uh, we do have. And uh, some of our very smart users of tactile diagram are young girls. Uh, thank you. Study. So there is a fair amount of, you know, okay, if my slides didn't have it, I must apologize for it. I think we, I would include it. So, we do have uh, this number except in bus device. Yes, on board we have very few women, uh, especially on surprise boarding we don't have. Uh, Thank you. Uh, okay, any last question? If anyone has? I would like to go on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, Abhisar here. Uh, uh, Bala sir, uh, I would like to ask, uh, this is uh, regarding the uh, our smart cane. Uh, I just uh, uh, wanted to ask if there is a possibility or like, uh, I mean, uh, I want your opinions over this. Uh, if there is a possibility that we can improvise uh, the cane, uh, like is there a possibility that we can integrate uh, uh, a camera device kind of thing uh, which can also uh, give me a kind of computer vision feedback like let's just say I am traveling somewhere and uh, I am encountering some obstacle but I just don't know what it is and if I can use that uh, camera to uh, take a picture or whatever just to get uh, get to know if there is a person or if there is a wall or if there is a tree so uh, can this be possible it's very much possible actually we have a prototype of a device like this we call it Mavi mobility assistant for uh, you know one of the challenges so we are so those are not part of the slide because what I put over here are things that have reached a certain stage Okay. Those are mm -hmm. still, I would say, at the research level. There is okay. a fair amount of work going on in object identification. And so let me tell you what the challenge is. Uh, mm -hmm. There are two major challenges. One is, uh, can we get this response fast enough? That is one challenge. Second, okay. amount of information that gets generated is so much. How do we convey the information without overloading? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because. See the difference is the bandwidth of vision is very high. Any image you see, you can absorb a lot of things in a very quick period of time. Right. Whether you do it through audio or tactile or through mm. vibrations, the mm. uh, bandwidth is very low in terms of being able to convey. So these mm. are the two challenges. So we already are working on, you know, for example, we have a this uh, project going on called Mavi Mobility Assistant for Visually Impaired. There what we do is we take a video screen and parallelly process through four uh, streams, uh, four different, uh, one of them is uh, signboard, identification and you know, 
OCR, which actually can be hand painted signboards, which are common in India and which are multilingual signboards. It can handle right. signboards in English and Hindi the campus. Then there is this uh, uh, another stream which we process to actually identify dogs and cats, uh, dogs and cows, which mm -hmm. could be found on streets in India and that could be a danger in terms of what. And the third one is which identifies the texture. You know, in mm -hmm. terms of it can find uh, undulations and things like that, potholes and things like that. And the fourth stream, and the fourth stream is based. Right. Today we are able to achieve on a device with uh, uh, two microcontrollers and uh, and the mobile is being used to give the feedback. So, okay. Uh, this is a solution which we have the prototype. We demonstrated it in the open house on the third week of April. But it is very far from anything I would call as a usable device. It is I would say still at a research stage. We are looking at maybe in two years' time we will have some solution which will be able to uh, address what actually the what we are. Nice, nice. Thank you very much, sir. Thank. Uh, uh, thank you. I had a I had a quick question, Akash. Okay. Yeah, okay. uh, one last one, really quick one. Um, so, uh, this is to follow up on Avisar's question. This is Karthik uh, Bala, sir. Um, so, have you um, explored, like, for example, a lot of the wearable uh, AR technology that's coming up, um, Oculus, HoloLens, and a bunch of those, uh, in terms of, like, helping out with, uh, you know, especially the latencies around, like, get, getting that feedback uh, from computer vision, for example? Um, what do you think about uh, you know the potential of those devices potentially coming into uh, the picture? Uh, and then the second uh, part is like uh, on the point of like overload. Um, do you think it does make sense to the point where you know we don't really understand uh, that we can make the most you know, the most useful information? Uh, does it make sense to perhaps? You know, we rely on human beings, uh, so almost like crowdsourcing. That uh, yet they can see the feed, um, uh, uh, you know, pretty much like see what the person is quote unquote seeing, uh, and providing and answering questions that the user might have. Uh, one issue is, in the real time, you cannot expect that one person is walking and there is another person who is going to be walking. That will not happen. Uh, AI technology solutions are coming, which are very good. We also, you know, the Mavi part we uh, I talked about. We are also using uh, alternate to doing processing ourselves to doing processing in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Similar questions of whether there is a dog in the view, whether there is a you know signboard and OCR. These things are also being provided by cloud solutions from Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. So we are also trying that out. So, so the challenge is. Uh, Conveying is still a challenge, you know, in the sense that we are basically saying that anything which is dangerous is in the push mode, everything else is in the pull mode. That means only when the user feels that he needs more information, he will pull the information. He will create the surrounding information into and know the surroundings, but not really keep on talking about it till the user actually wants to find out. This is the broad approach we are saying we also had some started some work on other sensors that can be used you know maybe something like a vibrating uh, you know, arm band and things like that that also some very preliminary work we have started with the okay. uh, I think there's a lot of potential I see that this area is going to really create solutions in the next two to four years right. you will see a lot of solutions yeah because one of the things that I've noticed here uh, is there's this company called Ira for example um, that that does uh, essentially this so they have like a wearable which is just like a, like Google glasses um, and you know they can provide like feedback to you and they have like specialized trained agents and uh, what people have been able to do with things are things like hiking for example with just the agent uh, I mean uh, granted that a lot of these people are very independent themselves and are really really good with O&M um, but like the, the biggest uh, impediment there again is the cost like they pretty much have like a hundred US dollar uh, price tag on their monthly subscriptions and I uh, I'm not sure if you know the technology is such which kind of uh, leads to that cost or you know whether there are you know even like cheap alternatives that could pretty much give the same performance um, so that might be an interesting thing no, but, to... but there is somebody who is actually watching what you're saying is. 
right right so then, then the cost of the person who is watching is becomes expensive yeah that would make sense yeah, yeah. Okay, I think now should uh, we should close it. Okay, yeah. so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you especially Professor Bar for briefing us on the suspect and bringing out uh, various efforts which we are taking at the suspect lab. This webinar can be listened again. It will be retelecasted on Radio Udan tomorrow. We will love if you will join us uh, on 30th of June for next webinar of the series, in which we'll have some other um, guests who will brief us on. some other research thank you everyone